Yeah, so we're very happy to have you here join us for the Carolinas Tug. This is uh, sort of the brainchild of uh, the collaborative uh, North Carolina-based Tableau user groups. Uh, this is, I guess, the second annual event that we've held. We did this last year, slightly different format. Um, it, it was a rare virtual event then. Uh, now, uh, well, it's just how things are. Uh, so we're very, very happy to have people from all over. It looks like we've got really solid representation across North Carolina. That is great to see. It's great to bring these groups together when we can. Um, you know, virtual has allowed us to kind of break down some barriers geographically about where and when we can meet. Uh, so really appreciate you wanting to spend your Monday afternoon with us. Um, so... With that said, hopefully everybody has had a chance to fill out this form unless your corporate network is blocking it. Um, <laughs> if so, sorry, trap from your phone. Uh, we'll, we'll keep that link populated in the chat so that it's front of mind and you can keep going after it. Again, it'll come back. It's really important to collect as many data points as we can on this. Uh, it is actively part of one of the presentations here in a few minutes. So uh, please, by all means, <laughs> give us some data. Um, Again, uh, so what is the Carolinas Tug? Like I just covered, we're, we're a collaboration of four North Carolina-based user groups. This is our second annual event. Um, again, virtual is the norm this year, so we don't even, I don't think, need to explain that at this point. Um, so our team, we're made up of the Raleigh and Durham Tug, the Charlotte Tug, High Country Tug, and Piedmont Tug. Uh, I've included uh, the leaders of each group on this page. So if you want information, more information about one of these groups or all of these groups, which um, again, you can attend any at this point because we're all virtual. Uh, you can attend as many Tableau user groups as you want. Uh, we all meet on a semi-regular cadence. I think uh, Raleigh meets quarterly in normal scenarios. Charlotte has two. We, we do a little something monthly. Um, High country, I'm not sure what your cadence is uh, or, or Piedmont, but we all meet semi-regularly. I think we've been very flexible all uh, in, in this virtual environment. Reminds me, I should probably introduce myself since I completely blew through that. For those who don't know me, I'm Jeremy Poole. I represent the Charlotte user group. Uh, you'll hear from, from, from other folks uh, in these other groups throughout today's presentation. Uh, so I'd, I'd love for them to introduce themselves in case uh, others don't know them as they come on. Um, but yeah, so really, really excited to have you join us today. Our agenda looks like this. Uh, there is going to be a bit of a holiday theme, right? So we're going to talk a lot about pie. Um, we are probably going to pay an inordinate amount of attention to pie charts than they deserve. Um, do not take any of what you see today as an implicit endorsement of using pies, <coughs> especially the second presentation. <laughs> Kidding, uh, William. Uh, William's going to show you a cool little hack. Um, but uh, yeah, we're going to talk a lot about pies, a lot about the holidays, and even some cocktails. So um, we're, we're going to have fun today, right? It's going to be really lighthearted. We're going to teach you some Tableau tricks as we go along. You're going to learn, hopefully in a fun way, and we're just going to all kind of spend some time together uh, around Tableau, which is something we all are, are pretty passionate about to be here. Uh, so our format today, right, we're going to have uh, Jenny, William, and Julia present. Um, during their presentations, if you will drop questions into the Q&A box in Zoom, uh, if you're having trouble finding it, let us know. We'll help you get there. Uh, drop your questions in. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can in real time as we go. Um, for other attendees, I was just told this. I don't know what it looks like. We'll test this out as we go. You apparently have the ability to upvote. So if somebody has asked a question that is what you, uh, what you were thinking of, Go ahead and upvote that and it'll, in theory, push it to the top of the queue. We'll see how that goes. Um, yeah, so uh, put, pop your questions in the Q&A. Um, Rashid, myself, uh, Jenny, Christopher, we'll all be looking to, uh, yeah, okay, I see how that goes. Perfect, magnificent. Um, you should just be viewing my screen share for now. You probably can see participants. I'm not sure if I can only see that because I'm a panelist. Um, you should have a participants button along the bottom of your banner. I'm pretty sure you should still have that as an attendee. Good question though. Um, so as we're going along, just drop your questions in the Q&A. We'll try to answer them live. Uh, enjoy yourself. That's the message of the day. We're, we're happy you've joined us. It means a lot that you've taken time out of your day to spend time with us. So we hope we'll teach you something in return. 
thank you again. And I will uh, turn it over to Jenny. Thanks so much, Jeremy. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen if, if you're done. Can everyone see a black, a uh, very blank Tableau workbook? Excellent. And the reason it's blank is because we are going to build this from scratch. And what we're going to build is a lollipop pie chart, not because you should ever build a lollipop pie chart, but because we can. So um, thank you for those who were able to complete the survey that we had at the very beginning. We're going to actually use that data collected and build on the fly a lollipop pie chart. So to start off, we're going to connect to our data. Click here and we're going to connect to Google Sheets because we collected this through a Google form that is populating a Google Sheet. So once we click on that, it's going to ask us what account and to give permission. We're just going to click through those and close this out. And then it lets us choose which Google Sheet we want to point our our dashboard at. So here we have all of our pie data. We have a timestamp, we have which tug that you belong to, and then there is one column for every different kind of pie that you were asked to vote on. But we don't really want our data to be in this format. What we really like is to have one column for all the pies and the one column for all your answers. So to do that, we're going to click on the first pie we're going to slide all the way over to the end and hold down the shift key, click on your last pie, and then we can right click on any of these and go to pivot. This is looking a lot better. We have one column that has all of our pies and then one column that has all of our answers. I'm going to go ahead and rename those. So you'll notice that do you like the following pie is, is repeated in every single row. We don't really need all of that extra verbiage. So we can do a little bit of cleanup right here in the data pane. We can go here and do a custom split using that opening parenthesis as a separator and splitting out all of our values. So now we have one column that just says, do you like the following pies? And we can just delete that, we don't need it. And then we have another column with our pies in it. Now it also has a closing parenthesis that we do not need, but we're going to actually clean that up in our, in our workspace. So coming to our first sheet, we're gonna bring this split over onto rows. Here are all of our pies with our closing parenthesis. And we're actually going to right click on that field and create a calculated field. We're just going to call it pi. And now we're going to use the replace calculation to get rid of that closing parenthesis. So in the, do you like the following pi split field, we're going to replace our closing parenthesis with nothing. And hit OK. We're going to bring that pi value over onto rows, make sure it all worked and it did. So now we have a very clean pi and we're going to take off that original value. All right, so now we are going to use our pies to build the stick of our lollipop. And what we want is for our stick to be however long for the number of yes votes. So we are going to have some staggered looking lollipop sticks. So I'm just going to bring our count over to columns. And this is just telling us, you know, 63 people answered the question about this pie, but that's not telling us how many people said yes. So one possibility is to bring your answers over into filters and you could just select those answers with a yes value. Now you'll see it's kind of a messy data set. Some answers have multiple answers, 
And for our purposes, anything that contains yes, we're going to use. All right, so we could do it that way, but really, I think we can come up with a better solution. Let's write a calculated field instead. All right, so we're gonna call this yes, because we're gonna count all of our yes answers. So if it contains, and it being the answers field, if it contains yes, then one, and that's all we want. We just wanna count every row that contains a yes. So we're gonna bring that up here to our columns. And now we can see that we have some staggered bars and that's what we want. So I'm gonna take this count off. And now that we have our lollipop stick, I'm gonna relabel this sheet. And it's time to go and build our pie. So I already know that I really want the answers to color the different slices of pie. However, I do not want it to look like a Trivial Pursuit playing piece. I only want two, maximum three colors on this pie. So I'm going to right click on the answers and create a group. So anything that has not got yes as part of the answer, we're gonna to group together. And for the sake of simplicity, we're gonna call it no even though it includes unsure. And for all the answers that do contain yes, we'll group those and call it yes. Okay, now let's try replacing our color with that. And that's definitely much more what I had in mind. I want two colors on the pie. We want a yes, we want a no. And then we'll just drag our count over here to the angle so that we have a slice. Now, Right now it's aggregating across the entire survey. So we're going to bring our pie out here onto rows to split that up. So now we have one slice that shows yeses for every pie and one slice that shows noes for every pie. And this is great. We've got our lollipop, we've got our pie that goes at the end of it, but how do we get them together? Now, if you're like me, you kind of have a general idea, you know, you need a dual axis, but you're not necessarily sure how you're gonna get it. So you just kind of start playing around until you figure it out. So I'll show you a few of the things I did wrong before I figured out how to do this correctly. So I thought I'd start with my bar and build a dual axis to add that pie lollipop onto the end of it. So I held down my control key and pulled this sum of yes over to duplicate it good so far. I do want my lollipops to be at the end of each stick, and that means they need to be in line with the number of yes votes. All right, so I came over to my marks card and went to the second sum of yes, and I changed it from a bar to a pie. Okay, still doing all right here. I need to bring the color, my answer group, onto this and this is where things started to go wrong. I realized it's only going to count my yes answers. And I do want it to count my yes answers. So it's placing the circle in the correct location on the axis, but I also want it to count my no answers. But because we're counting some of yes here, yeah, it's not counting the no answers. All right, so scrap that. Next, we're gonna come over to the pie charts. Maybe it would just be easier if we added a lollipop stick to our pies. So we're going to take our count, pull it onto columns, and then this is another problem. It split out my yes and no answers. So now the yes are all counted in one spot and located on their axis. The no's are counted in another spot on their axis. So this was not going to work either. So I thought about it and thought about it and I realized what I need is a secret ingredient. What I need is a level of detail calculation. So we're going to create one. We're going to call it secret ingredient. So 
what I want to do is to use the number of yes votes to locate the pi in the correct part of the axis, but I don't want to exclude the no votes in the counting. So I want to write a fixed LOD. I want to fix it at the level of the pi. And we're going to add a colon and then we want the sum of yes. And then we're going to close it with a closed curly Q. Always forget that part. So hopefully the secret ingredient is exactly what we need to build the viz. All right, so let's start this again. Let's pull out our yes votes to make our lollipop stick. That's good. We'll put our pies on rows to split that up. Still going strong. Now we're going to bring our secret ingredient out to the columns. Also looks good. It's still lining everything up correctly. On our marks card, we're going to change this to a pie. And then we're going to bring our answer group to the color. And then we're going to bring our count to the angle. And we finally have our pie and our lollipop stick all together. Now we just have to make it a dual axis. So we're going to click on the drop down and change this to a dual axis. And then it broke again. And the reason is because we left our first marks card set to automatic. And instead of automatically being bars like it has been the whole time, it changed it to a circle. So it's actually there, it's just hiding underneath our pie. If we had changed this to bars and not left it on automatic, we wouldn't have had that problem. So change that back to a bar. Now we're making progress again. However, our pies are not lining up with the end of the lollipop stick the way I want them to. And that's because our axes are not synchronized. So we will right click on the axis and go to synchronize axis and that is going to fix that problem. So we don't really need these headers. We can go ahead and hide those, do a little bit of cleanup to make this actually look like a lollipop. We're going to take the size of the bars and slide it down, make it look more like a sucker. We're going to come and edit the colors on our pie chart because I'm not really a huge fan of orange and blue pie. I guess I'm not really a huge fan of red and teal pie either, but it seems a little bit more holiday. And then we can delete this field label. We can go to format, get rid of some of these extra lines. We don't need zero lines. We don't need any grid lines on the columns. We don't really need any borders or dividers. And since I want these to look like lollipops, not one that's been dropped on the ground, but preferably one that you're eating, I'm going to flip that around. And we're going to get rid of these extra grid lines and hide that field label. And we're going to go ahead and sort these in descending order so we can tell really quickly the most popular pie and the least popular pie. Anybody surprised by that? I don't know many people who even know what mincemeat is, let alone eat it. So now we're going to go ahead and edit this title so that it's actually telling us something about the data that we're looking at. So what is this lollipop pie chart telling us? Well, it's telling us what are the most popular types of pie or what is the most popular and what percentage of people like it. Make that nice and bold. And then I'm going to use the title and do some color coding so that we don't need our legend taking up extra space on our dashboard. We're going to change the most popular type to match the color of the lollipop stick and the percentage of people who like it to match the yes. Well, that actually needs to be a different color. 
to match the yes. All right, now the next step we need to do is clean up our tooltip because this, this just looks awful. All right, so one thing I want to make sure is that I am on my all marks card, not the sum of yes bars or the sum of secret ingredient pies. I want to be on the all marks card, so I only have to edit this tooltip one time. All right, so what I would like my tooltip to say is the name of the pie, the answer group, and then I want the, the count of votes and the percentage of votes. We don't actually have all the pieces we need in here to do that. So I'm gonna cancel out of this for a moment. And we're going to pull, I'm going to right click on our count, pull that over into tooltip. And so we have our count of votes, but I'm going to go ahead and change this to a percent of total, so I can get my percentage of votes, but I don't want them for the whole table, which is giving me now, I just want them for that particular type of pie. So I'm going to go back in here and choose to compute using table down. That will give me the percentage I want. I also want to click, right click and format because I do not want a bunch of extra decimal places, I just want the percentage and no decimal places. All right, we're making some progress, looking a little cleaner here. I'm going to right click on my count again, pull that over into tooltip again. And this one will give me my actual count of votes, not the percentage of votes. So going back into our tooltip, we should have all the pieces we need to create that tooltip that I want. So we have our pie, and then we want to have our answer group to tell us, are we looking at the yes votes or are we looking at the no votes? So we're gonna type in votes after that. We're going to have our number of responses come next. And then in parentheses after that, just the percentage. All this other stuff can go away. We definitely don't want to tell anybody what our secret ingredient is. All right, now we have apple pie with 57 yes votes for 90% of people who voted yes for apple pie and six no votes for 10% of people who voted no for apple pie. All right, this is awesome. This is exactly what we wanted it to tell us. But what if we wanted to take it a step farther? What if we wanted to know well, which tug likes apple pie the most? Or what does the Charlotte tug prefer when it comes to pie? We can answer both of these questions too. So if we double click on which Carolina tug do you primarily associate with, it will, all, it will automatically put that up on our columns and it will automatically break our viz. You can see that the lollipops are no longer connected to their sticks. And the reason this happens is because in our secret ingredient, we're only looking at pies. We did not consider the tug when writing that. So we need to right click and go in to edit our secret ingredient. And we can actually put a comma here and add the tug question. And now when we hit okay, all of our lollipops are back. So we can see immediately that the tug that likes apple pie the most is the Raleigh-Durham tug. But what we can't quite as easily see is which pie is most popular for each tug because they're spread out along the bottom here. So if you wanted to switch the order of these fields in your column, now we can answer our other questions. So. Charlotte likes apple pie the best. The high country also likes apple pie. Oh, none of the above likes apple pie. I see a trend here. And here's Raleigh Durham also voting apple pie. So I guess we can see the apple pie is the best pie for all Carolina tugs for the holidays. And with that, I will open the floor for any questions that you all may have. I can go in here and check the Q&A box. 
Yeah, I don't think there was anything in the Q and A, but there was a heated discussion as to why chicken oh, pot yeah. pie wasn't wasn't in the yeah. list. Yeah, yeah. Can you chicken speak a little pot bit pie people who were just yeah, well, got left out. This yeah. was definitely more of a dessert pie than a. Mm. Pie. I mean, pizza pie could have been in there. Squash pie could have been in there. It was definitely not an exhaustive list by any means. I had a question. Yeah, the Google form. Mm -hmm. Is that connected? If someone were to answer the survey now and you push this off to Tableau Public, would it, would it stay up to date? Well, why don't we try that and see? Because I don't actually know the answer. Does somebody want to fill it out now? And so as an expert in this, since I do the uh, annual Viz uh, uh -huh. attendee survey for Tableau Conference, um, you can set an extract refresh of sorts for Tableau Public. It'll update once a day. Uh, it will not update live. Okay, good to know. Thanks, Jeremy. It'll update on a set. Case. You actually have no control over it. It'll set. It'll run in the mornings, uh, overnight. I think it runs at like uh, twelve GMT. Good to know. I think Christopher might be creepily frozen. Anybody else see his face frozen? Yeah, but that, his face normally looks like that, so it's hard. To <laughs> I don't see him at all. Out oh, there he went. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that, it, it's a good question, Rashid. It'll it'll update. Uh, it'll update overnight. Okay. Yeah, that was a, that to... was a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> it was a lot of fun to build too. Not yes, quite as fun Joe as Christmas Catlips, but Joe in the Q and A. Yes, you can. Uh, you can go out there to, you can go to Tableau Public and manually trigger a refresh. When you publish a viz that's connected to a Google Sheet, there will be um, a refresh timestamp below it. There will also be another button that says uh, request update, I think is how it's phrased. Um, and and that'll, uh, that'll also trigger an update. I do that a lot during the uh, Tableau conference season because people fill it out during the day and I wanna get those fresh results. And I'm we're not saying, aware of something you can do from forms directly. I know we're saying Tableau public, but it's the same thing on this regular Tableau online server too, as well, right? It wouldn't matter. Like you said, it would still be a um, once a day or manual refresh whenever you choose, right? I, I've never put anything from Google Sheets on a enterprise server. So I'm not sure if you would have more control. I would imagine you do. I would imagine you have access to your full refresh uh, cadences that you've set up on your server though. Okay. I've never been allowed to do that working for the banks. <laughs> Very much frowned on. Uh, neither have I, but one day, one day. Uh, Jenna, it looks like we got one in the chat uh, from Andrew. How long did it take you to come up with the logic for the secret ingredient? <laughs> well, I, um, I guess it depends on if you're talking about how much continuous time or, or, cause I, I worked on this for probably at least a week and I would think about it here and there as time allowed. Um, but once I, once I realized what I needed to do, it didn't take any time at all. It was, a, maybe it was a lucky first guess. Um, if the fixed LOD didn't work, I was going to try and exclude LOD, but I've never been very good at those. So I was really, really glad that the fixed LOD worked. I never know when to use exclude and when to use include. That's something I need to work on. Yeah, yeah, the, the, it, it can be a mess. No, that's that's good advice though. <laughs> cool, do we have any additional questions while we've uh, got this presentation queued up? Again, this was a lot of fun mixing lollipops and pies. <laughs> um, it's not something we home. do every day, uh, so yeah. Good stuff, though. It's a we, we joke about the, the the visualization choices, but again, it, it it's always handy to know how to build some additional things in, in the tool. Great, great, great. Um, looks like no more questions. Um, thank you so much for putting that together. A lot of fun. Thank you, audience, for your participation. Uh, it's always uh, <laughs> a little. Uh, scary when we're reliant on getting survey responses live to be able to actually uh, do that. <laughs> so thank you for coming through for us and uh, thank you for the presentation as well, Jenny.
Well, cool. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll move on to our next presenter today. We've got William Aubrey representing the Charlotte Tug uh, with Rashid and I, happy to, happy to bring him to you. Uh, we're gonna see another pie themed visualization. So in case you haven't had your fill, pun intended, uh, here's another chance. Uh, William, uh, take it away. Jeremy, thank you for the kind introduction. Yes, we're, we're gonna do more, more pie. Uh, it's holidays, it's pies, pies are delicious. So why not talk about pies? Um, my name is William Aubrey. Uh, I co-lead the Charlotte Tableau user group along with uh, Jeremy and Rashid. And so it's a great honor to be in, with you today across the Carolinas. So let's talk a, a little bit about this presentation. Um, I'm hoping that you'll take away three things today. Uh, Google Sheets, just as the way you saw Jenny use Google Sheets forms, it's a really convenient way to gather feedback. So we're going to go uh, just one step deeper to actually show you just the one or two uh, steps that it takes to actually use and build the form like the one that Jenny created. Um, the second step here, the second step is really a result of the fact that um, when we started planning this tug event a few two or three months ago, I think, um, I became really fixated on this one particular kind of pie chart. And I really wanted to make this one type of chart. And uh, I was having trouble with it. And I couldn't, uh, I couldn't get the data to work unless I took the data outside of my spreadsheet and processed it in some, some way. And uh, I don't know if he wants credit for this, but Jeremy, <laughs> the person shaking his head does not want credit for helping me to solve this problem. But he was a great help. And you know, it makes me remember that the number one thing to love about Tableau is the community. And that when you're, your greatest asset in Tableau is your peer group, you know, having people that you can rely on because you get a blind spot. Uh, you know, maybe you've worked in Excel for many years and you know it's a way to solve that way. Or maybe in my case, I've been in Tableau for many years now, but I just got a blind spot around how to solve this problem. And once I saw the solution, it was it it seemed very clear, but without having without having seen without somebody to show me the solution, I was just kind of stuck. So we're gonna the second point is we're gonna show how you can pivot data in a Tableau desktop, and it's a little bit like the pivot that you saw uh, Jenny do, uh, or at least it's the same spirit. It's a different way of pivoting, but it's the same spirit. And finally, you know, pie charts are fun. You know, uh, the the Many people may not agree that pie charts are a useful chart, but they are fun and they do break up the visual spectrum. So if you've got 10 pie charts on your dash, I'm sorry, if you've got 10 bar charts on your dashboard, it might be nice to have something visually that's just, just different. And um, they do have a long history. And so people do recognize them. Now the, the problem, Jenny also mentioned this, once you get more than three things on a pie chart, well, that's, that's rough. Two things on a pie chart are great. Three things are uh, okay, but more than three, I don't know. That's that's kind of my rule of thumb. So that's that's what we're doing here today. We're gonna try to take away Google Sheets, uh, thinking about pivoting in, with measure names and measure values, and just remembering that uh, pie charts are fun. Uh, right off the top, Google Sheets. Uh, maybe some folks are in the chat talking about Google Sheets. Who, who uses Google Sheets? Uh, maybe drop in the chat. Uh, how much? How much you love them? How often you use them? Uh, never, never use Google Sheets. That would be good to see. Uh, there are really four. Oops, let's go back to that. There's really four steps to using this Google Sheet form that you saw Jenny use. Uh, first step: Google Sheets, create a form. Second step: design your questions. Third step: send out the form, solicit feedback, and the final step is to get your data. So let's actually just take just a minute to uh, to look at how you do that. Let's just say I'm out here in Google Sheets and I've, I've already got most of this baked. So I'm, I'm gonna create a brand new one just to provide an example. You're, you're in your Google Drive, you create a new sheet. Maybe nobody saw me do that. Google Sheets, a spreadsheet, and you actually don't need to design any of your data in advance. You don't need to decide what your columns are gonna look like. You just go to tools, create a form, and you go right into the questions. So you can see how Google has this broken out so that here's your header of your form. Uh, I can be a little bit of a 
smart aleck. You can choose your question and then you can offer answers like this. There you go. You have some answers, you create your form and you can add new questions, any kind of question you want. There are multiple choice drop downs and uh, dates, times, short answers, paragraphs, all kinds of uh, all kinds of options you can have in there. When you're done with the when you when you're done with your questionnaire, the way you want to build your form, you just hit send. You can copy the link. You can shorten the link. Copy that. You can send it out via email. You can embed it in a um, in a web page. All kinds of options. So there you, there you go. That's how you create the form. Now uh, in our example, we've got the pie charts. And really all I wanted to, what I'm trying to establish here in this presentation is how do we go from having data where people vote to say this or that, this or that, this, 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 or that, a real simple voting kind of uh, visualization, maybe two, maybe more items. Um, the where, <laughs> where this started was a visualization with the idea of uh, cakes, cakes, candies, cocktails, or cookies and who would like most of the items. And that way you could lay across several items. I wanted to have a icon on top of it and I wanted to put size on the icon so that you could have something jump out at you visually and say, yeah, all right, well, quite clearly, uh, yeah, cocktails are the favorite thing among these options. And the same idea is here, to pie or not to pie. So there's your icon of your pie and then a little icon with a bar through it as not pie. You have, seven answers in the set, five of the answers are for pi, two of the answers are for not, not for pi. So uh, again, a real simple chart, uh, data gathering tool to pi or not to pi, pi, do not pi. People can answer as many times as they want to and you end up with your data. So in this case, we've got seven records. Now, um, seven records and where this is where we wanna go to. We wanna go to a, a pie chart, two pie charts um, we can see five of seven. So five of seven is in the orange in the first one, two of seven is on the other one, and then the inverse. So really these are these two pie charts are just inverses of each other. Here's the five of seven here, here's the two of seven. The white segment here is the two of seven. But when you when your data starts out like this, it's a little bit of a challenge to get the data shaped so that you can represent two pie charts separately. And typically you take this data and you make one single pie chart from it. But in, in my case, I was really fixated on this idea of separating them out to show some kind of voting, uh, voting results and also to show an icon on top of that as a dual axis chart. I really wanted to get that icon on there just to have it jump out at you. If that was your entire visualization, one single picture, uh, that might look good on a phone. If you were actually trying to use this uh, in a corporate environment, there are better choices. There are better choices for getting, um, having, uh, having the result be understood more automatically. Uh, there, and there are things that are take up less space on your dashboard. But this is, like I said, this is just a, sometimes you get a little fixated on something, you wanna try to make it work. And that's one of these cases. And it, it ends up with a little bit of mental gymnastics in the process to get here. So let's, let's talk about what had to be done. So you start, with this data on your left. These are your results from your Google form. People voted, well, one person voted seven times, but this person voted for pi and do not pi. And you end up with this data set. Um, but in order to make these two pie charts, we have, to, we have to know two things about the pie chart. For the two charts, we have to know the portion of the pi that is to pi or pi and the portion that is not to pi for pi, and the same thing on the other side, the portion of to pi for do not pi, uh, or I'm sorry, the, the portion of the vote that is for do not pi, and the portion of the vote that is not not for uh, do not pi. And this is the shape of that data. You want to be able to say, here's your attribute to pi or not to pi, pi do not pi, the percent for the pi, and the percent for do not pi, and as well as the difference. You know, one minus seventy one percent, one minus twenty nine percent. So they're just inverses of each other. So there, at this point, if you 
many light bulbs may be going off for many people and you might automatically know how to do this. The day, a few weeks ago, when I tried to do this for the other chart, uh, I just struggled. I struggled trying to figure out, um, well, how do I do this? That, it feels like a level of detail, I'm not real sure. And ultimately, like, I couldn't get it to do it without taking the data out, um, out of Google Sheets. I put it through pr Tableau Prep and I just, you know, uh, bowled my way through the Tableau Prep calculations to get my, to get my final results set. But there's actually a much more clever and simpler way to get these results using level of detail calculations. And so this, uh, the credit goes to uh, the person who will rename, remain nameless uh, for this, uh, for these calculations. But it's really just it's four things you have to do here. <laughs> you you need to have a record that. Uh, so, actually, I would love if someone would chime in here, Jeremy or Sheet or Chris, anybody. What happened to our number of records measure? We used to have a number of records measure and that's gone disappeared. Yeah. The uh, yep. ahead, number of records died <laughs> with uh, 2020.1 when relationships was introduced. That's when, yeah. that's so when. instead of using joins for constructing your data sources, Tableau now has the noodles, mm -hmm. uh, AKA relationships. Um, which is far more efficient in many, many ways and will greatly reduce the amount of upfront manhandling you some had to, sometimes had to do to <laughs> ensure multi-fat data models were at a, a similar granularity. Please don't let me go down this rabbit hole. I'll stop there. <laughs> Come um, on. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's bait, not gonna fall for it. Um, so short answer, number of records is no longer relevant in the relationships model. Yep. You can always emulate it with a simple sum of one, which is what I did here, William. It's just basically a, um, a, a dummy version of number records. And, and it, I think it's more accurate too. Number of records always, always said something, but it, it's actually just a, a count of whatever, whatever it is. So, so they just renamed it. Um, but as Jeremy said, it actually implies whatever data source you're looking at. And so, so it's, it's accurately describing what, what the number of records is doing. So over here on the left-hand side, we see form responses one. Form responses, that's the name of my spreadsheet. That's really our, the thing that took its place. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, so let's dig into these four calculations. And uh, Jeremy owned up to it. He helped me with it this this morning. Uh, many thanks, Jeremy, for this help. Um, records is the first one. And I, Jeremy, I actually have a question for you. Uh, so as, uh, let me get through the four calculations. I'm going to ask you the question. So records is like your number of records. It's just trying to say that at a record level, this is your sum of the number of records. So if you drop uh, a dimension on the sh on your row shelf, uh, however many records have that dimension, there this is going to sum that up. Right beneath it here, we have total records. And the real clever thing I like about the way Jeremy did this is that it's a and keep me honest here, Jeremy. This is a fixed level of detail calculation where the word fixed in the colon has been omitted. Yeah, it's it's a table scope LOD where fixed is implied. Um, it would have been the exact same thing if I'd have written fixed colon someone. So fixed is implied. Fixed is implied. That's probably a good note for all of us to remember that fixed is sort of the default level of detail and that include and exclude. That's a little bit fancier. You have to be real intentional about what you're doing with those. So we're, we're getting our record count at the level of detail of the worksheet. We're getting our, our record count for the entire population of the record set. So this is fixed at the level of the record set. So what it, when you put record, total records on there, it's always gonna be one number for every record. And in our case, we have seven records. So that field is always gonna result in seven. Over here on the right-hand side, you see how these two fields are used. We have records divided by, and in this case, average, min, or max could all be used because you're really just trying to get that, that one value, seven, one time, and you're trying to get the percent of it for whatever's on your level of detail. And in a second, we're going to show you that the two, the two dim the dimensions are to pi or not to pi, and the two values are pi or do not pi. So those are, at that level of detail, you're going to have some of your records, you're going to divide it by the total, and that's going to give you your percentage for whatever the dimension is. And then you just do one minus to get the opposite amount. Um, so there's a quick look at where we're gonna go, but I'm gonna walk you through the steps here. And again, uh, I've sort of got this little pre-baked, so we'll just kind of go through. Um, if you do have any questions and you do wanna see a step, you know, uh, done in more detail, just feel free to drop that in the chat. One of the folks here will ask me to go through it in more detail. 
but we're just going through, uh, we're, first thing we're doing is we're just gonna create a little table, uh, just a little tabular view of those calculations. So first records, you'll see that we're just doing the sum of one. And, and Jeremy, my question was actually this, over here on the calculations, I think would it have been interchangeable? We could have put records, we could have been, put, a, put one, just like we did with our number of records. And could we just have wrapped sum of records over here as the numerator? Yeah, bo both would have worked. Yeah. So that's, I forgot, I did that because I forgot that I was still gonna have to aggregate the uh, the LOD and percent four. That, that, but that was a 30 second shortcut that I tried to execute. But it, it's a real good point because whenever you're doing the LOD calculations, you'll, you'll end up accidentally mixing aggregate and non-aggregate values. And you always get that error that says you can't mix aggregate and level of details. So this is a, this example is so simple, but it also really does highlight that how you have to, um, when you get a fixed uh, level of detail calculation and you try to use that in the formula, you're, if one of your other elements is already aggregated, sum of records, then you're also gonna have to aggregate that LOD. I think I'm saying that right. Okay. Uh, so let's go look at the calculation. Again, uh, records, just the sum of one. And total records, fixed level of detail, sum of one. We're gonna do our percent four. So you see here in our data, we have two people, two votes for do not pi, five votes for pi. The total records is seven for both of those dimensions. And percent four, we're just taking the sum of records, uh, two divided by the aggregated version of, of total records, which again, that could be average, that could be min, or that could be max, as long as it's not sum. If it was sum, it would, be, it would end up being 14, and that would be incorrect. But uh, two divided by seven is about 28%, five divided by seven is about 71%. And then we just take the inverse of those two values to get the uh, remaining, inverse isn't quite the right word, the um, one minus that number, and that just gives us the opposite value. So now at this point, we now have data that's shaped like we were hoping to get. We we're trying to get an attribute that said pi, that's gonna end up on our color. And then the percent four and the remaining percent are both gonna be used in measure names and measure values to uh, give us our size angle. So let's go, let's go take a look at that. So uh, the very next step is we're gonna configure our pies. And I guess I could probably try to do this in a little bit more detail. Um, looking at the time, I guess we have time to do this kind of in detail. The, the trick here, let's see if I can, let's see if I can just do this step by step. So first we wanna separate out our two columns. Uh, I want pi on the left-hand side just for aesthetic reasons. And I'm actually gonna jump back and forth here a little bit. Our measure names, that's what we wanna have on color, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna require uh, all of the measure names. We're gonna switch this to a pie chart we're gonna put uh, measure values on angle, but we don't need all of the pieces. We just need the uh, percent four and the remaining percent. And you can see here, I've already, I've already colored it so that uh, the percent four is one color and the remaining percent is just invisible, or in this case, white. Now, I do like that uh, border myself, just so that you can see what is the absence. So it's clear that there's two pie charts there's a positive amount and then there's a negative amount. Let's see, is there anything else to configuring those two pies? Pi, do not pi, oh, that's pretty much it. At this point, we've got pie charts, but I still wanna, I still want those icons on there. Uh, I see that it says pi, I see that it says do not pi, but if, the, if you were making a voting thing for any other two things you wanna compare, the iconography is kind of fun. It's kind of fun to see a real, uh, especially if there's a big difference between these two numbers we're gonna put that on size and it's gonna really jump out at you. So let's, uh, how do we do that? We need to have uh, two sets of these uh, so that we can do a dual axis chart. And the way I always do this is to add a field called a mock axis. And again, it's just the number one, nothing special about that, but it just lets you center things up, put them on to an axis. And you can see that I've dragged mock axis up to the top in two places. And what that has done is it's created two charts exactly the same. So that's, that's how you set up the two charts 
And when you want to do them as a dual axis, you just click dual axis and they collapse back down to one. But before we do that, we're going to add our shapes to it. So kind of re revealing the answer before we're, you know, we get there, but the same chart as previously, but the difference here is I went to the second axis and I changed it to shape. And I already had some shapes kind of in my back pocket here. So over here on the axis, I was going to edit the shape. And uh, one of our community members turned me on to this website called noun.com, noun noun.io. I forget what it's, anybody? Feel noun good? project, the noun, noun project. Okay. So I love going out to the noun project, grabbing these, you know, many creative people out there grabbing uh, uh, icons. Uh, and you can grab them for free with, with um, attribution. So they have the name of the artist uh, on the icon. Um, sometimes I rip off the name of the artist, but I try to uh, put like an, an, a credits page somewhere in the, in the workbook to say icons made available by this artist. That's, I think that's good recognition. Point is, uh, here you go. There's the first item. I had a pie shape for it. Uh, I created a do not, uh, do not pie shape for the second one. Put that on there. And now we're ready to make this a dual axis. So in our next chart, we see we're going straight to, well, let me just demonstrate that, dual axis. So there we go. That's our dual axis. Our icons are uh, over the bar, over the pie charts. You can real quickly see what it is. Of course, there's a lot of layers of meaning in this one on the right. You know, you got the pie chart, you got the pie, and then you've got this no symbol. So not really something I'm recommending that you do. This is sort of a mental gymnastics exercise, uh, not necessarily a best practice exercise. But there we go, we had a dual axis. And then once you do a little bit of formatting, you would go out to uh, the size on this, the second axis, and maybe you want to set the overall size of the icons here. You know, for example, if I to make them small, they, they both shrink at the same rate. Um, but I want to show most of all, I want to show that the winning icon is much bigger than the losing icon. So you can do that by placing the value percent four on size. And then you've got your size dialog box where you can make uh, many different options. You can do it automatically by range from zero. These are some other options. Really, this is where you play and it's all about your, your aesthetic choices. So. I set a range of, you know, about wherever this represents and then about whatever that represents. And it just looked like a, a good size to me. So did that. Uh, the only other thing that you might change on a chart like this is to uh, change the font size uh, so that you have something that's really visible. My biggest pet peeve, pet, pet peeve of watching data charts on television or on web pages is whenever someone's made a really great chart, and I know it's gonna be really informative, but the bars and everything you see, but you can't read any of the labels. You're on television, you're watching the news, and there's, it's just completely uh, illegible. So cranking up the font size on your, on your header or on your title, I think that's a great way to make things visual, especially to um, an audience that's gonna watch it through a different medium, not tablet server or tablet desktop. Uh, let's see. I think those were, uh, so again, not necessarily best practice, more of a mental gymnastics exercise, uh, something fun to show. And then uh, just some reminders about uh, using these level of detail calculations to, in, in a sense, pivot your data from one shape to uh, a pivoted shape. And we'll make this uh, presentation and the workbook available to you on the community site. If there are any questions, let's uh, let's dig into them. William, there was one question, and both me and Jeremy, oh, I, uh, Jeremy has a basically the same response that I would have, and it was from Kelly Reese, and it's, what are the pros and cons of Google Sheets versus Smart Sheets? Um, uh, I can take a shot at this. Oh, but go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, it's, it's funny that you ask. I, I just recently started a project working with the Smart Sheets API, um, we, uh, a project management. Um, uh, project. We wanted to bring the data in from Smartsheets and then um, and then process it in Snowflake. Now, so Rashid, you might have a better answer than me, but my, my reaction to, uh, to that project was to, my understanding of Smartsheets is that it's, it's really a spreadsheet, but it's like um, it's got value added features where uh, you have like a project management template in a sense. 
that's already out there. So you can get some neat uh, quasi project management features like a Gantt chart in uh, some of those things automatically. I think, I'm sure there are some other templates, but I'm not familiar with the other ones. G Sheets, G Sheets is just a generic kind of spreadsheet, but J Rashi, what do you think? Yeah, and it's funny because I would, I'm, I don't have any experience with smart sheets. Let me level set by that. And just like everyone else in corporate America, we all use Excel for most of our spreadsheet stuff. But I would advocate for Google Sheet in that. And I don't want to take credit for this. I'm going to put a link in, in the chat for everyone. Back in June of um, this year, the Austin Tableau user group, I believe his name was Greg Rossi, did a great presentation on how to leverage Google Finance in Google Sheets. And what that means is with Google Sheets, you can use other modules of Google which is kind of compelling, meaning you can put a, 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 a column of just stock tickers and Google will then bring in live, you know, or real time stock information. I mean, it can leverage things of other aspects of Google within a spreadsheet that, you know, you can't really do that kind of stuff in Excel. So I always thought that that was really cool that, that you know, that you can do some of these things in a spreadsheet. Yeah, it's actually, I think if you use the Google, if you just pre preface it with Google finance or something like that, keep that, yes. And to what William's doing now, to your point, you can see that these formulas, some of the stuff that you would have had like in Excel that looks just like an Excel formula, this can actually access other parts of the, the Google infrastructure to pull in other information. So there's there are certain times where these types of things come in handy because I've already built a dashboard that uses this. Um, so it's just one of those things to be mindful of. Sometimes there are pros and cons to, to like I said, I don't know anything about smart sheets and I'd love to learn more about them, but there are pros and cons to Excel, Google Sheets and, and probably a whole bunch of other ones. But yeah, Chris, Jenny, uh, Stephanie, you guys have any you know opinions? So um, one of the other questions, Rashid, that came up was, uh, you know, for instance, so I, I know my, my office, uh, Google Sheets is all Google is blocked as a, you know, the third party data source um, tool. So we, we utilize um, Microsoft Forms. So that's all part of the Microsoft suite. Um, but you can also use things like SharePoint. There is a native uh, SharePoint list connector, uh, which you can, you can create a SharePoint list off a Microsoft form as the output. Um, yeah, William's going right to it. It's on. Yeah, no, go click cancel. William, it's right there. Yeah. So um, there you go. SharePoint lists. So uh, this, you may have to do some, again, to, to steal Williams' words, some gymnastics here, uh, depending on how, how your security at your, your office is set up. I know I've been at two different companies where one of them yeah, just pointed right to it and I used my, um, my, my Active Directory account. The other one was not so easy. Um, so just be prepared for, for that with any, any of these connectors. Um, your, you know, your mileage may vary depending on your, uh, your workplace security, but yes, but you, so you can do all of that using kind of the Microsoft suite there and Tableau's already baked in all of those things for you. So. All right. Oh, well, thanks. Uh, thanks for everyone for uh, listen, walking through that presentation with me, Christopher, let me turn it over to you. Yes. Thank you so much. William, so I have the privilege, and I know we're um, we are really early. So, um, so I'll uh, so Julia, you have as much time as you need. Um, I have the privilege of introducing Julia. Uh, I, I'm I'm going to massacre your last name. So, and so I will it's let Bidri. you. Bydri. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. I knew it was one of the other I pronunciations. Um, so. So let me let me give a little backstory here before I, I introduce her and let her just just go off because we do have a few minutes here. Um, so as as you've seen, all of our wonderful Carolina Tugs uh, presenters have have given their amazing presentations, collecting data, doing all of these things on pies, on um, on desserts, and and all of these things. So I, as you've seen, love beer. I love cocktails. I love all of these things. Uh, so when it when it came time to uh, kind of divvy up the roles for this tug. Uh, the cocktails fell to me, and um, so I'm I'm spending days and weeks scouring the web and looking for all of these data sources. And so I just hit the pause button and let this be an example. Uh, you really an example and a learning opportunity for all of you uh, that as you're going into projects, as you're going into presentations, anything that you're you know that you're doing. Um, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Uh, so this was an opportunity for me as I was scouring 
all of these public uh, databases and things like that and APIs and really just spending lots and lots of time. Um, and I just hit pause and I went right to Tableau Public, which is what I should have done in the first place. Again, another plug for the hundredth time of Tableau Public on this, on this call. Um, I went right to Tableau Public and the first thing I found was Julia's uh, present or dashboard on cocktail recipes in a dashboard. It was almost identical besides the color, which I'll let her talk about <laughs> in a little bit. Um, it was almost identical to what I had in my mind's eye and the exact way that I would put together and kind of view it as a, as a kind of a recipe book. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna steal her, her thunder or anything. Um, but that's, that's how I found Julia. Thankfully, she is also another tug leader, which I'll let her talk about too, about the tug she leads. So, um, it's just another great opportunity for, for those of you that are in the, in the Carolinas that, um, as Jeremy mentioned earlier, uh, this is a unique time. So we can either, I've said this to my, to the RDU tug. So apologies for RDU tug members, if you've heard me say this, but I'll continue to say it. This, you can look at this time, uh, as an opportunity to really get bummed out, which you know, I had the, I had that mentality when it, when we first started this, um, get bummed out and say, okay, we're not meeting in person or glass half full, right? Cocktail glass half full, uh, <laughs> and look at it as, as an opportunity that we get to interact with and hear from people. Um, you know, chances are Julia never would have come down to Raleigh. Um, it just never, our paths never would have crossed in that instance. Um, but but now we get the we get the awesome opportunity to hear from folks like like Julia to tell us uh, you know all about her her thoughts on I mean and, and the the as I've talked to her you know her impetus on creating this dashboard and and her whole thought about you know being in you know in a pandemic and in quarantine and what can we do how can we use Tableau to do all those things so anyway uh, I will get I'll, I will get right to it and and just introduce Julia. It's been a pleasure to get to know you thus far, and I'm really excited to hear more about your your viz and your whole quarantine project and, and who you are. <laughs> so take it away, Julia. Thank you. Sure. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Okay. Yeah, I've learned enough about pandemic world that I should always check that first. Um, cool. So hi, everyone. My name is Julia Baidri. Um, So I'm actually located in New York in my childhood bedroom, my lovely quarantine hideaway right now. Um, I'm usually located in DC though. Um, I am actually an employee for Tableau. So I am a solution engineer for Tableau. Um, so what that means is I help customers see and understand their data um, on the pre-sale side of the house. So when customers are validating Tableau for their organizations, um, I'm the kind of technical side of the conversation, making sure it fits in with their environment, um, understanding their needs and you know meeting them as best as possible with Tableau. So it's a pleasure to meet all of you. Um, let me actually share my screen because by way of introduction, you can get a little sense of my background. Um, I have a super fun resume viz. Um, so yeah, this is me. Um, I'm Julia Baidri. I My second last name is Gonzalez. I'm half Polish and half Puerto Rican. So uh, sometimes I use my second last name. But yeah, like I said, I'm an employee for Tableau. And um, yeah, it was super exciting to get uh, the note to get involved today. Um, I'm a tug leader as well, um, like was mentioned already, and I, I love, you know, presenting and uh, giving talks to tugs. So it's uh, great to be here today. Um, I'm the uh, one of the tug leaders of a tug that's called Comunidatos. Um, so, like I said, I'm half Polish and half Puerto Rican, and and um, Recently, I've met with a lot of colleagues about the need for more content for um, our Latino, Latina, Latinx users at Tableau, not necessarily even just here in the States, but throughout LATAM as well. So this tug has been formed um, exactly for that purpose um, in the past couple of months. So it's very exciting to have the opportunity to be um, a tug leader for the first time. Um, and I highly recommend, you know, any of you who, um, you know, are super comfortable in Spanish or uh, identify as Latino, Latina, Latinx to join our tug. Um, like I said, we're kind of in the, the uh, starting out phases, but would be very excited to have um, any of you join us. And I'll actually, let's see if I can pull it up really quickly. Yeah. So this is our tug. 
Uh, we actually just had an event last week, but uh, we plan to have events about every month, um, alternating between English and Spanish. So yeah, I would love to have any of you join us um, at a future Tug presentation. Um, yeah, so just finishing off with my introductions here. Um, yeah, I was super excited to get the message um, all through Tableau Public, uh, another plug for our awesome community. And I'll talk a little bit then about my cocktail recipe visualization, which uh, you can see right here. So like many others during the pandemic, um, I've been you know, finding myself with a lot of time on my hands. And I started out with the pandemic super ambitious about all the projects that I was going to accomplish and you know, all the free time that I had all of a sudden. And um, yeah, since then my, my best laid plans have kind of been waylaid as they, they um, often are, but I did have the opportunity to spend some time creating um, a cocktail recipe visualization, which initially was planned to be published on this blog that I'm also working on as well. So as kind of an introduction for the eventual viz I'm going to share for you, this is kind of where the idea came from. Um, so this is my blog. I really only have two articles on it. Like I said, um, kind of got sidetracked here, but um, yeah, because of the pandemic, I was very interested in searching about Google Trends and what people were interested in during the pandemic, how search behavior has changed since the before times until now. You know, are people all adopting puppies now, which I, I felt like I was hearing all the time. Are people all on TikTok baking sourdough bread? Is that reflected in the data? So um, while looking into the data, um, I used Google Trends for this actually, I found quite a few interesting trends. Um, for example, this is a viz that I made on uh, groceries versus takeout um, being searched on Google. So you can see the big spikes here throughout the pandemic. Um, like I said, oh no, this is not, this is cooking bake, bake, uh, recipes and baking recipes. And then here's a sourdough trend. So that was a trend in the early pandemic of a lot of people Googling how to make sourdough recipes. Um, but another thing that I noticed was cocktail recipes were definitely trending up. And this is, you can see at the end of March, beginning of April. So right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so I was wondering, oh, so what, you know, what are the most popular cocktails? What are people searching for? So I did a little bit of further analysis here and you can see as I am, um, oh, we got to reload here. You can see as you hover over the states here, I've got um, a vision tool tip that shows the most co uh, popular cocktail bases per state. Um, so once I had done this analysis, I was thinking, you know, what would make it easiest to allow people to, you know, maybe come onto the internet with a certain cocktail base in mind, for example, vodka and different ingredients in mind and figure out, you know, what they could make with what they have on hand. So say you have vodka and lemons, like how many different cocktails are you able to create based off of the certain ingredients you have? So that's kind of where the idea for the cocktail dashboard, the, the cocktail recipe, um, the cocktail recipe book, I think is what I actually eventually called it. So that's where the idea kind of came from. Um, and I'll jump over to it. Cool. So this is the cocktail recipe book dashboard. Um, so again, the idea for this came totally out of the pandemic. Um, I searched also high and low for, um, you know, suitable data sources for this. And it was very difficult uh, to figure out a data source, but I eventually finally figured it out. And I'm very happy that I did because my whole idea here was again, given a cocktail base and certain ingredients, how many different types of cocktails can we make? So a little tour of the dashboard functionality. We've got our instructions up here. So choose a base from the top of the visualization. Then you can add, uh, select additional ingredients on the left here. This over here will update based off of your selections. These are all different names of cocktails. And then finally, once you've selected a cocktail, the recipe card will show up down here. So say I'm picking gin and I have lemon juice or maybe triple sec. Then I can see here all of the different cocktails and say I can I can multi-select here too um, that I can make. So let me click Bluebird, for example. Okay, so here's my recipe card, Bluebird. I have all of my ingredients down here with their different measurements and instructions. And we also have a little picture over here too. 
Um, so yeah, this was what I eventually came up with with the data. Um, so this is the finished product, but I'll kind of back out from here and uh, start from the beginning on, on how I found the data set and how I got to the point of uh, constructing this because it is very surprisingly difficult to find clean data related to cocktails on the internet. Um, so let me jump to that. I can 100% concur. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and also, if there's any Q and A's or any uh, questions, if you know one of you panelists would let me know, I, I'm not sure how to open that on my screen actually. So, if there's anything along the way, definitely let me know. Um, sure thing. Thanks. All right, so let's start at the beginning. So, when I first did the search for where is this data existing for all of the the, the cocktail information on the internet, I um, found a couple of CSVs and a couple of, you know, easily downloadable Excels, but they were kind of lacking for what I wanted to eventually create. I really wanted a comprehensive data source that had, you know, as many cocktails as possible in it. Um, so I eventually found this, which is the Cocktail DB. Um, it's an open sourced uh, drinks and cocktail um, API, um, as well as kind of a almost a dictionary itself of all of these different cocktail recipes and how to make them. So, you know, if you click on one of these, you'll see the ingredients here and um, how to make it. So this posed a problem for me because I am not super skilled in, um, you know, uh, making calls to APIs or, you know, Python or coding just in general. I studied it in college very briefly, but I haven't really used it that much um, since entering the working world. Um, but since I had a lot of time on my hands uh, because of the pandemic, I, I figured I would, you know, try to figure it out. So I came here and found that there was no, you know, ability to just download data in a CSV or an Excel format. Um, you have to just connect to the API. Um, so I figured that I would just, you know, try it out. And it definitely took me a very long time to, to finally get it to work. Um, but basically, you can see here a little bit of information about the API. So um, they have these kind of URLs that you can utilize for looking up certain cocktails or co list all cocktails by first letter, for example, all of these different kind of sample, um, you know, queries you can do to the API. But um, what I soon figured out as well was that there was a limit on the API um, unless you paid money to how much data you could extract. So not only did I have to figure out how to call to the API, but I also had to figure out either am I willing to pay for this or is there some sort of recursive loop that I can write to get around this, um, this API limit, um, which I also ended up figuring out, which was awesome. But um, yeah, so I, there was a lot of noodling that went on here and, and having to figure out how to write the um, API call to actually get it to work. But I ended up with this. So like I said, they only allowed you to take, I think, 10 uh, cocktail recipes from the API at a time uh, in, without uh, signing up for a paid membership. So I figured out this ability to kind of feed this list of different um, cocktail base names to the API uh, and get around that, that um, you know, limit there. Uh, so I was very excited when I figured that out. But Basically, uh, what this code means is uh, make a list of all of these different, you know, names of cocktail bases or names of common cocktails. And then for I in that names list, here's the base URL without the um, search query attached to it, add each of these names one at a time in a row to the base URL and then get the data. Um, so the final kind of issue that I ran into with doing this was that I figured out finally how to output the data, but the data was coming out in a JSON format. And uh, for those of you who use Tableau a lot, JSON is not always the best um, you know, format for data to be in uh, to bring into Tableau. So I had to figure out an additional step of normalizing the data from a JSON to a, um, you know, like a regular CSV. So this, that's what this step is doing right here. So. I imported the, um, the pandas library, I imported JSON normalize, and then I normalized the JSON uh, into kind of a flat CSV format um, and then output it to my computer. So 
I know I'm kind of glossing over this like it's the easiest thing in the world. It definitely took me probably weeks to get to this point. So um, for those of you who are more familiar with calling to APIs or writing Python, this would probably be a lot easier for you. But uh, since I had a lot of time on my hands, I, I finally figured this out. And it really opened my eyes to how much other data is out there that, you know, if I had these API call skills that I could pull. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of publicly facing data out there on the internet, you know, Makeover Monday, data.gov portals, Kaggle, data.world, what have you. But this, you know, kind of expands the universe even broader for, um, you know, for someone who's willing to pick up a little bit of Python and, and pull some data from an API. So I think it was definitely well worth it, uh, you know, kind of figuring out this uh, method here and getting it to work eventually with um, a CSV. So that's kind of the data portion. Um, has there been any questions so far? Um, I'm going to move on to the dashboard next. Yeah, hold on. So, uh, oh, someone was just asking for the the tug, the LATAM um, Communidados link. Um, so oh, yeah. you can share that in the chat later. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Let me. How do I get to that more? Oh, here it is. Okay. There you go. There is a link. Would love to have any of you join us. Um, hey. All right. Cool. So that's the data portion. Um, that's how I got you know the CSV out into the wild so that I could work with it in Tableau. So let me open up my dashboard and tell you what happened next. So the data issues actually didn't end there. Um, I was hoping they would, but as many things go, there was actually a few more steps to be done before I could get to this point. So if I open over here, you'll see what I'm talking about. So you can see here a string ingredient one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So what I realized when I output the data was that all of the measures for the ingredients and the ingredients themselves were in individual columns. Um, so normally in Tableau, what I would do is just pivot that and, you know, easy as that, pivot all the ingredients into one column and pivot all of the measures for those ingredients into another column. Um, however, what I ran into once I realized was um, the, I wanted to be able to separate out the cocktails based off of their base um, liquor. That was kind of the primary ingredient. And for most of the um, the cocktails, most of the cocktail recipes, this primary base was listed as the first ingredient in the first uh, column here. So string ingredient one. So when I pivoted that, I wasn't able to uh, then anymore pull that initial ingredient um, and kind of name it as the base. So what I ended up doing was um, pivoting a single version of the ingredients so and then kind of combining it to itself so that I had both uh, formats. So I had one string ingredient here that had uh, the name of every single ingredient in this. And I will caution, this is like not a great idea for enterprise data sources. I mean, it works because this is not a very big data source, but um, you would end up duplicating the data quite a bit if you follow this method. Um, so I'll just caveat it with that. But I did end up pivoting the data, um, getting all the ingredients in a single column, but also keeping all of these other ingredient um, columns as well so that I could pull from the first ingredient column the kind of base for the cocktail while also having all of them in a single column as well. Um, so I hope that makes sense. So once I had done that, I was able to isolate the base for each cocktail. Um, and from there, there was a little bit of grouping involved here too, actually. Um, so it wasn't entirely clean um, as is often the case with data, but I was able to get to basically where I wanted to get to with the base here. So from there, I just created a pretty basic, you know, um, I call this, I don't know, not necessarily a box plot, but just kind of a box visualization here that basically mocks up the idea of buttons for each of these different bases that you'd be able to select as a user. Um, and once I had done that, I wanted users to be able to select a, uh, a certain one of these bases and then, then be able to select or multi-select uh, various different other ingredients that could come in the cocktail. So what I did here was I used that one pivoted column, the string ingredient, 
added it to rows and then added base on color here um, so that when it's unfiltered, you can see all of these different bases, these colors um, correspond to these different colors down here. So you can see just kind of at a glance that, um, you know, a lot of gin recipes, sugar, lemon juice, lemon, triple sec up here. So um, that's what the color is on this visualization, the, the base. Um, and then I used a, a count of the unique ID of each cocktail recipe um, as the count here so that I could show, you know, sugar is the most popular ingredient followed by lemon juice and then lemon, powdered sugar, um, et cetera. Finally, with these two visualizations here, let me go here. I think I also use the noun project for this. So I heard a plug for the noun project earlier. It's super useful again for these um, different icons that you use in your dashboards. So another pretty simple visualization here. Um, I just listed all of the names of the drinks um, as well as just an icon with a little martini glass here so that it again looks like a button so you can select and uh, filter the rest of the dashboard like so. And then finally the recipe card. Um, again, I had a little bit of uh, wrangling fun time with the recipe card, but I'll show you how I resolved that as well. So this was the place where the um, ingredients being split out actually helped a little bit as well. Um, I was able to kind of list them out like this using that. So you can see kind of the formula of my recipe card um, right here. So I have the name of the drink up top, ingredients. So I have you know, the measure of each ingredient followed by the ingredient itself. And then I have the instructions down below um, and then a little note to enjoy. And I wanted to format it like a recipe card. Um, so I, when I brought it into the dashboard, I brought these, you know, funny little bracket shapes around it because I wanted it to look like, you know, this white space in the, you know, beige dashboard that could be, you know, an actual recipe card that you pull out of a recipe book. And then the last element was really just the name of the cocktail over here, which again updates as you select and go through, and then a picture of the cocktail itself. So if you go to this picture, this is a URL also directly from the cocktaildatabase.com um, API site. So that was super useful that um, along with the output of the data also came these URLs that I was able to point directly to that image. So in my actions, uh, typically with a URL action, you often have to kind of append a, a search phrase to the end of a URL, but um, in this certain data source, the URLs actually came fully preformed. So it was pretty easy to just URL link directly out to the images in the cocktail database and, and get that image to show up. Yeah, so that's pretty much how I've made the dashboard work. Um, I've published it out since to Tableau Public, which again is a really great place to find inspiration on um, all things Tableau. So in addition to kind of my inspiration around Google Trends data, um, I have another colleague, Tyler, who works at Tableau, who has created a similar visualization when it comes to cocktails, who I was also inspired by as well. So. Um, yeah, a lot of different places to get inspiration and a lot of it kind of centers on, on Tableau Public. So my one frustration actually with Tableau Public is that with this dashboard specifically, you can see that my image isn't pulling through exactly right um, on Tableau Public. And I looked up the resolution for this and I think it was something about um, not being able to pass through like HTML specifications through to Tableau Public to get the image to render uh, perfectly for some reason, and then having to kind of host it and pull it through to a web page yourself to get it sized correctly for Tableau Public. So I kind of gave up on that point <laughs> at this point. Um, yeah, it doesn't really affect the functionality of the recipe book, book too much, but um, you know, if I were to continue to work on this in the future, I would probably address that uh, pull that image through to my own uh, web portal and then kind of size it correctly for the dashboard. Yeah, so that's kind of a full overview of the dashboard here. Um, you know, happy to take any questions on uh, anything I went through so far. And hopefully this has inspired all of you to, um, you know, start working with APIs and, and get your hands on more data out there as well as, uh, you know, continue to collaborate on Tableau Public. 
Yeah, thank you, Julia, so much. That was fantastic. Um, we had uh, a few comments about the, the colors and your favorite. What is your favorite, uh, I guess, uh, question, what is your favorite color palette? As you can <laughs> clearly see, it is Hue Circle. Um, Hue Circle. I know it's obnoxious, but I love Hue Circle. Um, I I like to when I'm creating dashboards for customers, which I do, you know, like every day for my job. I, I put it in Hue Circle just for fun sometimes, just to look at it myself. I never actually send it to customers, but it's always fun to see what it looks like with my, you know, rainbow smiliness. So, yes, I love Hue Circle. <laughs> Excellent. So I actually did have a question for you because I, and I think we've got, um, do you have a GitHub yet? Do I have a GitHub? No, I don't. That's a good question. It's a good idea. Um, I should probably make one of those. I'm kind yeah. of just getting integrated fully into the Tableau community recently. I've kind of noticed as a tug leader that um, Twitter is super active and I should get on that and uh, GitHub and all of those other resources. So yeah, Comunidatos has really been kind of encouraging me to get um, out there with my creations a little bit more. So that's a great point. Yeah. I should make one. And yeah, so question. my question, go, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, no. are, are you gonna be willing to share your Python code? Cause I would even love to try to take a shot at that, to tell you the truth. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I can, you know, I can send it to you, Christopher, if that works. Um, yeah. That's but fine. yeah, I, it, it took up. me a bunch of, um, I searched kind of all over the place for, and I put together like 15 different snippets I found from all these different um, <laughs> instructional pamphlets about Python and eventually my Frankenstein code worked. So that was great. <laughs> so, so my question is actually, is a question for you and a challenge if Rashid wants to go after, after the code, actually it's a challenge to everyone on, on this call um, is the, uh, so in your code, you grabbed all the data, but the one thing you did not do, which actually I was, I, when I finally saw your bar chart just now, it, it, it clicked. Um, the one reason I kept getting so frustrated and, and really just kind of threw, threw it against, you know, threw my computer out the window, um, was I was trying like in your recipe card where you have, you know, a quarter, a quarter ounce of this, a, you know, one shot of this or, you know, and so I was thinking like I've seen in a few dashboards, like the pie chart, which shows the the breakdown of ingredient type by size. Like if you if you normalized everything to ounces, right? And so you probably miss a few things, but that was the one thing I could not do because, like you said, the measure and the ingredient were were two separate. They were two separate fields. So you not only have to pivot that, but you'd also find had to find some creative way of of joining that data together. So you you took it, I think, to the the perfect end of your dashboard, I think is the perfect end to the, the raw data or is, you know, and even all the other stuff you did. Um, so you didn't have to get crazy. Like I was going, like my, <laughs> my brain went down that rabbit hole. Um, but I, I think you did such a fantastic job. So um, did you try that? Did you try to get the, um, the portions of the recipes out of there? I tried a bunch of things at the beginning um, and yeah, pivoting it, not pivoting it, uh, measure values, not measure values, you know, all of those different things, converting things, you know, all that yeah. stuff. Um, and I think I kind of hit the wall that you hit and decided that, um, you know, this was good enough for what I wanted to show. Um, so yes, yes, I did. And I ended up with kind of an unorthodox shape of my data, like I said, uh, with, you know, one of the columns yep. pivoted, but also the, the data uh, also appended on unchanged as well, because I used both fields for different purposes. Um, so yeah, it was kind of an unorthodox use case, but uh, the kind of thing that you don't run into a lot with customers. So it's kind of fun to, you know, stretch your brain in that way. That's right. Yep. That's good. Any other uh, questions? No, I think I thank you. And yeah, and the GitHub, that's it. So thank you again. Again, uh, you know, Comunidatos, if you, uh, even if you are, are not Latin American or, or any, any of those join uh, this, that's the beautiful thing about our, our Tableau community. Um, we can all join and learn, learn from one another, get new perspectives that again, you know, if it would have just been me, I, we would have had definitely not as, as colorful or, or engaging of a time um, as bringing you on, Julia. So thank you for your time. Thank you for engaging with us and being, being part of our Carolina's Tableau user group. Yeah, Jeremy? absolutely.
Yeah, thank you so much. I, I had to miss the first little bit, had to hop off for a while, but this will definitely be one I'm rewatching. Uh, really, really, really nice to have some special guests. Uh, virtual enables us to do so many cool things we wouldn't normally be able to do. So thank you uh, for joining. Yeah, no problem. It's great to meet all of you. Yeah. Um, so for the audience, do we have any Q&A left over that from uh, any of the sessions today? Anything you want to talk about that we covered today? Uh, anything you'd like to see us do for the next round of uh, Carolina's Tug? Uh, anything you'd like to understand about how to access this content after the fact? Or um, uh, getting connected with one of the groups represented here or elsewhere? Uh, we can cover lots of stuff. Uh, so we have today's recording. Uh, we will publish it to the uh, to the attendee list today. Uh, it sounds like we may have some code snippets as well to share potentially. We'll see. Um, whatever you're comfortable with there. Um, uh, each of the four user groups, if you go out to usergroups.tableau.com, we're all represented there. Uh, I think in our wrap up email, we'll probably just link all four of them for you. Feel free to join one or all four. Uh, again, you are not limited by geography here virtually. You can be a part of the London user group. You can be a part of San Francisco. Whatever, uh, whatever Tableau content you want to consume, you're more, more than welcome to. But we've loved having you with us. Um, yeah, that's all I've got. Thank you to all of the presenters today, all of the folks who teamed up to make this thing happen. Uh, you guys really, really did an awesome job pulling this together. Love the theme. Very hungry, very thirsty right now. Um, so... Uh, yeah, much appreciated. And we'll open it up. If, if there are any questions, pop them in the Q&A. Uh, looks like, yeah, uh, yeah, oops, looks say, like there's one. one question. Yep. Yeah, go yeah. ahead, Rashid. No, no, I'll let you take that one. Because I, I, <laughs> the question for everyone is, does anyone deal with version control uh, of source data? Uh, I'm lucky enough to not have to deal with version control for source data. But for anyone else on the panel, that's a great question <laughs> from Julia. Yeah. So. There, there are a variety of lo-fi and hi-fi scenarios to this, right? Or solutions to this, right? From as lo-fi of working with versioned documents in Tableau or versioned saves in, in Tableau to using formal CICD processes, repositories, et cetera. Um, whatever is appropriate in your organization, you should stick to. Uh, you know, we use, we've used Git, we've migrated with Python in certain places. As a consultant, we kind of see some different things. I've also worked in very informal environments where it was, um, yeah, we're going to save it in this folder locally and pray no one deletes it. Um, so lots, lots of things can work in different orgs. Um, you know, wh whatever you feel is most appropriate for the team you're working in. Uh, any other takes on that? I'll, I'll echo that. It just, uh, I, we've, we've started to use um, Tableau as a the prod as a good source of source control, both for data sources for Tableau data server as as well as for for the workbooks. Um, so there's not a version one two three. It's the the whatever you know cash flow dashboard revenue dashboard, um, and then the revenue data source uh, that gets updated. And you can always go back and, and check the revision. And you can and if you're if you're so inclined, I also highly recommend if you're asking this question. Um, get involved with the Tableau servers user group. Um, it's a virtual user group. They, uh, server admins user group, uh, they, they talk about these things all the time. So Mark yeah. Liu uh, out, of, out of Silicon Valley, um, he is a genius and, and one, of my, uh, one of my mentors and, and one of the first, first guys that I got hooked up with um, in the Tableau community and being a, um, an accidental server admin, we call ourselves. Um, so anyway, yeah, I, I definitely recommend doing that. You can, if you're if you're interested, go check that out. But also, you can. Mark has a lot of, of blogs about this, um, so you can set the number of revisions that you go back, um, how far you go back, which which ones you keep, and things like that. So go check out Mark Wu's blog and the Tableau Data uh, Admin Data Server Admin User Group. Yeah, that that's really good advice because the last thing you want on your server is dashboard name final 87.42.date <laughs> you know it, it starts to get a little messy never <laughs> yeah from the tableau side i actually i also recommend utilizing the revision history uh, feature yeah. in server you know you can always um actually i have it right here you can always use 
this right here yep. on your data sources or workbooks to uh, revert back if something gets messed up or you know move forward. And this combined with, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the data management add-on. Um, not everyone has that, I know, but it's a really powerful capability to allow you like full visuals uh, over your data and lineage, impact analysis, all that. Yeah, any other, any other questions? Doesn't look like we have anything active in the Q&A again. Great crowd today. Looked like we got up to about 110 at one point, I think was the highest number I saw. Uh, so man, really appreciate you guys taking the time to spend your Monday afternoon with us. Um, I hope everybody has a wonderful holiday. Um, take some time for yourself. It's been a crazy year. Relax, uh, celebrate in whatever way you deem appropriate <laughs> and just uh, get some R&R &R at the very least. Um, so for, from my end, uh, thank you for another wonderful year of um, user group meetings. Um, you know, we've had a great year in Charlotte, done some really cool things. So thank you to our Charlotte crowd. We look forward to seeing you in the new year. Um, any of the other leaders want to sign off, please feel free. <laughs> yeah, thanks again from, from, the, uh, from the Raleigh Durham. My, my, my group showed up. We had, we had a lot of <laughs> Raleigh Durham folks here. Um, so, so thank you all for, for the privilege of, of getting to, to lead the user group for, for another year. Um, this between, between Charlotte and Raleigh, the high country being our newest capital user group in the Carolinas and then the Piedmont. This is a fantastic state um, that is really at the cutting edge. I mean, we, we talk about New York and DC and California, um, but when we talk about cutting edge of, of technology and businesses that are, that are driving innovation and technology and, and even in Tableau, um, you know, I think this area and, and Atlanta are two of the, the biggest hotspots for this. So um, I'm just always so excited about about this, who's using Tableau and, and everything. So um, it has been a, a great year, even though you know we've, we've continued to thrive. I'd say that's, that's been the, the biggest thing I've noticed this year um, is we haven't, we haven't just survived, but the Tableau community has, has thrived. Virtual conference, virtual user groups. Um, it has been, it's been a year of first, but, um, but the, the energy has, is not, has, has, you know, ticked up, not ticked down. So, um, and I think that goes for the Charlotte group and it goes for all our Tableau user groups. Um, so again, it is a, is a pleasure and I look forward to 2021 as well. So thanks, Jeremy. Awesome. Awesome. Looks like we got one more comment there in the chat. Uh, would love to see how people are using prep. All right. We'll talk mm. about that a lot in the new yes. year. <laughs> yes. Love it. It's on the list. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everyone. We look forward to seeing you in 2021, whatever that may bring. Uh, see you guys soon. All right. Bye everybody.